good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay through this mic? Yes, great. So Marika took us to the Great Lakes, and I'm going to take us back to the Great Lakes, but to a different time period. Marika focused on life after violence, and I'm going to talk about life before violence. I should say I'm probably going to also disappoint Lars, not just because I'm not very good at typekeeping, but also that my paper, what I'm going to talk about, is primarily about ethnicity rather than inequality. So with that preface, I was going to, the, the way I thought I would do this was to share three thoughts that I had um, about the relationship between ethnicity and violent conflict. And uh, the insights that I'm going to share, and this is my opportunity to plug a book that I recently published, uh, come from this book, which is called The Path to Genocide in Rwanda. And it's an intensive case study uh, produced uh, over 10 years uh, based on multiple trips to Rwanda, uh, talking to Rwandans about what happened before and during the violence um, in the early 1990s. So, um, since I know that I'm a bad timekeeper and that Lars is a very strict um, enforcer, I thought that I should probably start with simply telling you what my three thoughts are in the case I don't get to the third or second one. So the first is simply this, that the distinction made in theories of violent conflict <clears throat> between those theories which emphasize ethnicity and identity and those theories which emphasize rationality and materiality, that that dichotomy is a false dichotomy and that we should look to soften that distinction. So that's the first somewhat abstract theoretical point. I'll try to make it more concrete in the presentation. The second is this, that ethnic extremism isn't simply the product of differences between ethnic groups, but also the product of differences within ethnic groups, and that there is a strategic dynamic interaction that takes place both between, so inter, and also within intra-ethnic groups that produces ethnic extremism. And the third and final point, which I may not get to, um, is that ethnic radicalization, by which I mean simply the development of extreme negative attitudes and beliefs towards an ethnic other, that this isn't only something that precedes ethnic violence, but it's also something that is produced by ethnic violence. Okay, so those are the three thoughts. Now, <clears throat> here's the, the evidence that comes from the book to kind of substantiate those three claims. Okay, so the first claim, the distinction between ethnicity and rationality. So theories which emphasize ethnicity tend to use language that's emotionalist, um, emphasizing concepts such as ethnic pride, ethnic loyalty, um, ethnic grievance, uh, ethnic anger, ethnic fear. And these are very closely associated with theories that emphasize uh, ethnicity and identity. In contrast with theories that emphasize, theories which are based on reason or rationality, where the language tends to be that of interests rather than identity and strategy and elite calculation. Um, and what I'm going to try to demonstrate is that these perspectives on theories of conflict are in fact reconcilable. Okay, I should say that there is of course, as many of you will know, a normative bias within political science, and perhaps more generally social science, towards theories that emphasize reason, cognitive processes. I, in my personal view, think this is a product of the Enlightenment, which largely sees emotions as kind of a subversion of reason. So privileging cognitive and rational processes to explain social and political phenomena. Um, but I think that that's a, a mistaken uh, bias in the literature. Okay, so I wanted to illustrate this, um, I wanted to illustrate this by a decision, perhaps one of the most fateful decisions in the Rwandan genocide, and a decision that would have repercussions for, for the world, a world historical decision. And this is the decision that was made on the April 6th, 1994, the fateful day when President Habyarimana of 
Rwanda was assassinated. But the decision that I'm interested in is not the decision to assassinate Habyarimana. It was the decision made after his assassination. And it was this, this was the decision made by these two individuals, the man on the left, Deonist Bagasora, the man on the right, Paul Kagame. These two individuals made the same choice. They each chose to resume a civil war and to fight until one side was the victor. They abandoned the idea of negotiation. They abandoned the idea of striking some kind of peace deal. And just as a, by way of background, uh, Bagosora is the extremist leader of the government of Rwanda following Habyarimana, at least in the very early days. Paul Kagame uh, was the head, the military head of the RPF, the rebel organization that was challenging the government of Rwanda. And I'm sure you may know some of these histories too. Uh, the government of Rwanda, at the time that that decision made, was actually the militarily weaker force, objectively speaking, compared with the RPF. And uh, I'm sure, as you know, the ultimate outcome of this battle, of these decisions, was the government of Rwanda lost and the RPF won. Okay, so was this, let's focus, I want to focus on the decision of the loser, so the government of Rwanda. Why did Teonest Bagosora and his uh, extremist allies make this decision to fight a war um, that they would ultimately use? Was this the product of reasoned or rational thinking? So they preferred to fight rather than to negotiate. Well, uh, as I mentioned previously, it doesn't seem rational because it was very clear to any outsider that, I see I'm not going to make it to the end of the third point, um, but never mind, you still got to get this one, um, that they were objectively militarily weaker. Okay, so I think this decision was not the product of rational calculation. Was it then a purely emotional decision that Bagasora and the other extremists, well, they just would rather die than actually have to share power with the RPF, a Tutsi-focused organization? Hmm, okay, but when we actually observe what they did in the end, when they were finally cornered on the border with the then Zaire, they didn't fight to the death. They actually ran across the border and hid, where many of them still uh, uh, are there today. So it wasn't that they preferred death to sharing power with the Tutsi. So it couldn't be explained as a purely emotional decision either. The way that I attempt to, ration, to reconcile these perspectives is this that the reason that Bagasora and the others made this decision is they simply, they calculated, it was a rational calculation, but it was simply a miscalculation. And that miscalculation was made, the mistake was made because their judgment was clouded by emotion. And the emotions in this case were anger because they believed that the RPF were responsible for killing their president, Habyarimana, and also hostility, uh, the anti-ethnic bigotry uh, that um, characterized uh, much of um, the civil war period in Rwanda. So this should not be a surprise to students of social psychology. So students of social psychology would know this, that cognitive processes, um, attention, evaluative judgments, probably estimates, perceptions of risks, et cetera, et cetera. All of these rational decisions are actually shaped and affected by our emotions too. So that's my first point, that reason and emotions are not irreconcilable, but in fact work together to produce decisions and outcomes. Okay, let's see if I can get through at least the second claim. Okay, so this is the claim that extremism is the product of both intra- and inter-ethnic dynamics. So here is it, uh, very crudely illustrated. An intergroup interaction produces an intergroup interaction, which in turn induces another intergroup interaction, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially it moves along this way towards escalation and polarization. So how did this work concretely in the context of Rwanda? Another individual, this man, Justin Mugenzi was a party leader. He was the leader of an important member of the government coalition. It was the Liberal Party. And that's important because this was the party at the time that was most closely associated with the Tutsi elite inside Rwanda. And he was a confirmed moderate. 
but this, and here's the evidence that he's a confirmed Mavad. I won't read it because we don't, I don't have enough time. But essentially, if you were to read this, it's simply saying that he thinks that we should share power. We shouldn't fight. But then he changes. And he changes <coughs> because this man is assassinated. This man is Melchior Indadaye, who is the Burundian Hutu president, the first Hutu president uh, in Burundi in October 1993. And when he is killed, assassinated by Tutsi, by the Tutsi, by Tutsi soldiers in Burundi. This has massive implications for politics in Rwanda. And one of those, so this is an, a between group interaction between uh, Hutu and Tutsi, so an inter-ethnic interaction, admittedly in another country, but that would have implications inside Rwanda. And the implication it has is that it actually divides um, the uh, political parties inside Rwanda into moderate and extremist factions. So Justin McGenzie, perhaps the most confirmed moder one of the most confirmed moderates, radicalizes. And he makes this speech a few months after Indadaya's assassination. And essentially, again, without having to read it, he's simply saying, mm -mm, now I'm siding with the Hutu. We need to protect the Hutu majority in this country. So he radicalizes. And that was the product of the intergroup interaction. The third and final claim, which I will only be able to simply tell you um, uh, in very broad uh, terms, is that <laughs> radicalization, by which I mean um, developing these extreme negative beliefs and attitudes of um, ethnic others, that this <clears throat> isn't simply the outcome of, um, uh, 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 it isn't something that precedes violence, but also something that is produced by violence. And it actually, what I'm doing here is another theoretical reconciliation, because there are these two contrasting perspectives on perpetrator behavior. On the one hand, people think that perpetrators are just very ordinary individuals, that there's nothing that distinguishes them in terms of their disposition. They don't have radical or extreme attitudes or beliefs. But on the other hand, there's a second group of theories that says exactly the opposite, that these perpetrators, in fact, dehumanize and denigrate and hold these radical views. They're very bigoted, and that's what drives them to, to participate in violence. Um, <clears throat> what I'm simply showing or trying to suggest is that not only does the causal direction move in this direction, but also it moves in that direction. And that's important because it helps us to address another puzzle in, uh, in theories of ethnic violence, which is why is it that we see so much gratuitous pain and suffering inflicted on victims when you could quite simply kill them mechanically. And the reason that we see coerce, we see cruelty when perpetrators claim that they are coerced is because individuals who are indeed initially coerced radicalized through the act of violence itself. The act of violence is a transformative act. So not only do attitudes drive behaviors, but behaviors also drive attitudes. And that is how individuals who feel coerced actually come to commit atrocities and cruelty. So I'll end it there and thank you for your patience.